Welcome to Paranormal Almanac. With your host, Kurt Sandvig. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's talk just a little bit about Haunted Wisconsin. But first, as always, we've got shout-outs. That's right, let's go do the shout-outs to the patrons. Head on over to patreon.com slash paranormalalmanac for even more Paranormal Almanac and semi-weekly fun Zoom meetings. We've been hanging out. It's been cool. All righty, shout-outs going out to Karen, Ethan, Sylvester, Duran, Nikki Loves James, you can't tell her she doesn't, Cobalt Slayer 42, Lori, Alicia, Rebecca, Esteban, and Stephen, that's Stephen Share. Jennifer, Heather G., your friendly neighborhood skinwalker. Those are the kind of skinwalkers you want. If you're going to have to have a skinwalker, I recommend having a friendly neighborhood skinwalker. Zuzus, what's it? Nico Share and the Mouse. Mark Tortuga, Mike from Jersey, Jay Bizzle, Andy, Tracy, Virginia, Tony, Jason, Vicky, Crow, Clay, Buzz, Lobito Works, Glacier Maine, Isabel, Jen, Jen, Stacy, Amber, Tracy, Kelly, Joe, Menace the Beast, Kick-Ass Magic, Robot, Webcomic. Kick-Ass Magic, Robot, Webcomic. Man, I said that weird. I'm sorry. Sandy, Paige, Kausch, Bentman, 666, Andrew, Scott, Andrea, Melody, Vanessa, Marisol, Liam, Roger, Alicia, Becca, Jake, Charlotte, and the Beasties. Elizabeth, Void, Tech, Sherry, Art Muffin, Trudy, Tim, Kenneth, Ricardo, Ian, Alexandra, George, Zozo the Demon, <laughs> Hayden, Cindy, Ashley, Carrie, Robin, Will, Lauren, Russell, April, Isabel, Audra, Dorian, Cindy, Bob, Stacy, Paula, Jerry, Jeff, Joe, Lawrence, the Lawrence Strawn. Hey, howdy, hi. Veronica, Autumn, J. Mark Manning, Carolyn, Jade, Nashi, Chuck, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson are back. Hey, I just hung out with them. Just the other day. It was fantastic. Dan, Laura Pitts, and finally, Gamer Fan, with two special shout outs to Joe Teague and a Stitch. Oh, actually, wait, we got one more shout out. What am I talking about? While I was chatting with everybody, um, well, like on the on the weekly, so what we're doing is we're doing these weekly Zoom hangouts with all the patrons. And first one was just like, you know. Let's talk about spooky stuff, you know, that kind of thing. And then the second one was like, fuck it, let's just talk about anything. And we were just talking about weird-ass crap that was going on. And just, you know, like, I was telling some stories that that won't be ever told in public, really. Um, You know, so just having some good ideas, some good old fun. But um, Dorian was on there. And I was like, oh, Dorian's, man, I haven't seen Dorian forever. Dorian's an awesome guy. We used to chat back in the day. And uh, so Dorian and Isaac, we used to check back in the day on, on Zoom, like during the pandemic. And when, you know, Dorian's, Dorian's son, Isaac, he was like this little kid and stuff. And so like Dorian's chatting to us, you know, and the Zoom chat. And he starts talking about, you know, oh, his son who's, you know, 16 and driving and hanging out with people and like having party and fun stuff. And and I was like, oh, you should try and get him in the show. He's like, well, he is. He's, it's Isaac. And I'm like, wait, what? Isaac is like. 16 how did how did that happen when did that how did that happen so yeah special shout out to isaac who i don't know if you guys are aware of this because apparently i'm not uh people just keep aging and keep getting older so you know it's been three years so 13 plus three is like 16 so yeah it all makes sense but still absolutely blew my mind because in my mind, like I say, I just picture him as this this kid that's, you know, this cool kid that listens to the show. And now he's probably taller than me and buffer than me and cooler than me. And, well, you know, so he gets a special shout out. All righty. So for the speaking of those Monday Zoom hangouts, this Monday coming up, I don't know the date. Um, look, look it up. The 26th, there will be no new patron hangout but there's it's for a good reason though it's for a very good reason because i will be interviewing next week's guest on this show at that time 
So Monday evening, I'm going to be interviewing the next week's guest. And I'm very excited to have him on the show. I really am. Uh, should I tease him? No, I'm not going to tease him. Just know we're going to be talking probably a whole heck of a lot about UFOs because this guy talks about UFOs more than me. Is that right? Is that it? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out in the next week's episode who talks about UFOs him more, him or me. It might be me. I don't know. It might be him. Very, very eager to find out. All right, let's take a, uh, let's do a quick paranormal news. And by quick, I mean, there's a lot because I had a week off. So let's get into this. That's true. It is time for Paranormal News. And again, as with all Paranormal News in the past, I don't know, six months, if not longer, this is a very UFO-heavy Paranormal News. Um, I didn't know how much I wanted to really talk about this stuff, but I'm going to throw it in the Paranormal News. Like I said, the next week's guest and I are probably going to be talking about UFOs. I'm just going to guess. So a lot of this will be probably covered more in depth from him and I next week. But... This week in Paranormal News, military whistleblowers have been making UFO claims for 70 years. The truth is out there, but it's probably not in that latest whistleblower report. That is true. That latest whistleblower report is cool. It's neat. Look, the government has basically said, yeah, we've got aliens. Yeah, we've got UFOs. But everybody's, you know, concentrating on a sad story about a, a, a sub that went down You know, make all the jokes you want about it. There were people that died last week on that sub and then, you know, refugees on on a boat. So there were bigger stories, if you will. So the UFO stories kind of get, like, thrown under the rug, really. People are calming down about, like, it's no longer the biggest story in the world if we talk about, yeah, we have a UFO, which is something that we've been talking about, by we, I mean me, for years now. Disclosure will be real small steps until everybody gets bored. And then, yeah, okay, we've got UFOs. And everybody will be like, yeah, okay, that's kind of what we figured. There's enough news stories cruising through the cycle that you can just get thrown under. So, yeah, the first one is about uh, whistleblowers and how we've had uh, whistleblowers for the past 70 years and UFOs for the past 70 years and how no one's really paying attention. I'm going to... Breeze past that one because, again, I want to talk about it with our next week's guest. So up next in paranormal news, is the government concealing UFO crafts and dead extraterrestrials? This comes from BU Today. I have no idea who BU is. So I'm assuming it's Boston University, but that's just a guess on my part. I don't know. Um, It says it's, it's enough to make a conspiracy theorist's head explode. An alleged deep state cover-up for retrieved extraterrestrial craft and corpses of their pilots. But... It's sounding more and more like it's true. And it does. Uh, Between Arrow and all the other government agencies that are talking about stuff, it really is sounding more and more like this is true. Uh, Vox and a New York Times podcast have since covered the claims of whistleblower David Grush, who I've talked about before. They said that nobody at the level of him who has been to Congress has ever talked about the often alleged ET cover-up by the feds. Well, that's not true. It's talked about often. But I get, like, his level? All right, maybe not. They say that most UAP sightings have been found to be explicable by factors that are down to earth, as it were. That's a terrible way of saying they have human origins. But not anymore. Uh, They said, so what's your take on David Grush? He said, I don't particularly, I don't don't know him, but I'm well, well aware of the story. Uh, It would be inappropriate for me to speculate on his motives, but one can state objectively that his claims are two steps removed from being earth-shattering. Well, I don't think it's two steps removed. Kurt here, I don't think it's two steps removed. I think it's just there. And that there's then they quote that horrific Carl Sagan quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, which if you listen to um, uh, my interview 
uh, with Dr. Travis Taylor, he doesn't like that quote either. I don't like that quote either. Look, evidence is evidence, extraordinary or otherwise. So they go back and forth on is is what he's saying true? And they're trying to, in the most government way possible in this article, say that, you know, it could be, I don't know, it, it could be true. And I hate that shit. Look, again, at this point in time, you don't have to sugarcoat it. You don't have to walk around it or overstep it. It's not going to blow any national secrets that they have found UFOs and or aliens. Let's get past that. Let's get to the point where they start telling us the truth about it. All right, up next in paranormal news. Yeah, I'm cruising through them, but for a reason. Up next in paranormal news, government concealed huge, huge number of UFOs, a senator says. Senator Josh Hawley, a Missouri Republican, accused the U.S. government of covering up a huge number of unidentified aerial phenomena, also known as UFOs. The number of these is apparently huge, huge. And that is something that the government has, the best I can say about it, downplayed, if not kept from public for a very long time. Yeah, that is very true. This is why these things have to come out. More and more people are going to have to come forward to say, my grandfather saw a UFO back in the 40s, or my great-grandfather, or my dad, or whomever, or if they're still alive, have them come forward. It is essential. Kurt here, this is essential for these stories to come out while these people are alive. Because if they come out after they die, people will go, well, maybe he didn't really say that. He's, he's dead now. We'll never know. Already up next in uh, paranormal news, Bigfoot expert reveals key tips for spotting presence of the elusive beasts. All right, this is good. Everybody that wants to go and find a Bigfoot, this guy says, here's how you do it. Expert Thomas Markham of the Crypto Crew has said people exploring in and around forests should keep their eyes peeled for potential signs of Bigfoot activity. Beyond the usual foot tracks, okay, that's a good point. Look for tracks. That's number one on there. There are other possible sightings and indicators of Sasquatch activity with an eerie with eerie stick formations used as signs of Bigfoot pack sightings. So look for weird stick stuff. Other signs of the beast can include tree breaks, which means Bigfoot is traversing the area at the same time as those venturing through the forest. Okay, so you want to look for trees and you also want to look for sticks. So if you go out in a forest and you see trees and sticks, you might have yourself a Bigfoot. He goes on to say, there are some things a person can look for, such as unusual stick structures, archways, and tree breaks. But of course, we always like to find foot tracks in these same areas. It does take some outdoor experience to help determine if a structure is possibly made by a Bigfoot or something natural. All of these small indicators, foot tracks, stick formations, and tree breaks can mean that Bigfoot are traveling the area. Is that it? Come on, you got to have more than that. The majority of people out in the woods would not notice some of these formations. Two of the most uh, found formations are the X formation and the TP style formation. You can, they have a little drawing, but you can kind of figure what that means. You know, big branches put in an X or big branches put in a TP. Um, let's see. But Bigfoot stick formations can vary greatly. Over the years, researchers have attempted to decipher the meaning of some of these formations, but there is no general consensus as to what most of them mean. Also, the meaning may vary by region or by Bigfoot group. Uh, let's see. He says that um, he's aired previously aired his concerns over the recent whistleblower evidence given by the government source relating to the existence of UFOs. He says the elusive creatures experts, the elusive creatures expert, oh, he is worried that the news of this information could muddy the water of other searches for the likes of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. Kurt here, not a monster. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You can look for UFOs, and you can look for Bigfoot, and you can look for Nessie, and finding any of those or having them be in the news does not muddy the water as far as I'm concerned. All righty, up next in paranormal news. But that's just me. I mean, what do I know? I'm no expert. I don't know what a tree TP is, whether it's natural or a Bigfoot. All righty, here we go. Here's a video that I've been wanting to watch for a little bit. A family vacationing in British Columbia spotted and filmed what appears to be a curious creature that could be the legendary lake monster known as Shushwagi. That's right. We're not talking about Nessie. We're talking about Shushwagi. Shushwagi. From the Shuswap Lake. Sure. All right. Cool. Let's, uh, let's watch this shit. Um, let me turn this up so I can hear it. Boom, howdy, let's go. Did you guys see it? No. 
What on earth? Is that what the ripples look like? No. That was different, different, but that's it weird. It was bigger, but it's similar. Very similar. Okay. It's a video of a lake. Whoa, whoa. There's, there's ripples. Or not ripples. Uh, two big things. Oh, it's oh like... My... <gasps> what? Where? What? Oh! There is something there. Jeez, people, calm down. You're going to scare the Shushwagi. What is that? All right, that is interesting. Now, to me, it could be seals playing, but I don't know about enough about the Shushwap Lake to know if there are seals in the Shushwap Lake. So as always, with a cool video like this, I will throw it into the uh, Facebook fan page, the Paranormal Almanac fan page. It's a great place for fans to get together and chat and have a lot of fun. But if you want to watch this video, I'll throw it in there, and uh, you tell me what you think. It does look like that, but again... It could be seals playing or sea lions. I don't know enough about the lake to know if they're in there or not. Well, I suppose I could. What the hell? Let's look up Shushwap Lake. Seals, sea lions. Um, all right. Images for Shushwap Lake, seals, and sea lions come up with a lot of photos. It's uh, Shushwap Lake in Canada. And it does have a variety of salmon, seals, and sea lions. Me personally, I am now more leaning towards that's exactly what that was. But again, go and check out the video and you tell me what you think. Alrighty, up next in Paranormal News, a Major League Baseball player visiting Milwaukee for a series of games against the Brewers. His name was Carlos, or is, not was, he didn't die or anything. Carlos Martinez of the St. Louis Cardinals was staying at the Fister Hotel when he got a Fister of sites, let's see. Let's go to his Instagram. What? His page isn't available. What the hell, Fister? Um, well, I want to see Carlos Martinez's Instagram because it has a ghost on there. What the crap? All right, now I'm getting angry. I didn't specifically didn't watch this video because I wanted to do it live, and um, now I can't. No posts from that one. Oh, I'm getting angry. Nope. All righty. Well, let's just read what he said he saw. Um, he had a ghost that just appeared in his hotel room, and that was not, and that he was too afraid to sleep alone. Oh, well, you know what, Carlos? Figure out Instagram, man. I can't. I don't have time for that. Let's move on to the next one in paranormal news. We got uh, multiple witnesses in Ohio report seeing a rotating UFO in the night sky. This is another one that a lot of you have sent me that I've been really eager to watch, but I didn't want to watch it until I did it live. So here we go. He saw the lights around 1030 or 11 last oh, night. Yeah. And take a look at this video he sent us. You can see a ring of bright green lights rotating in the sky. And another video taken by Bryce Garrick also shows those lights. And then oh, all of a really sudden, is. you can see the lights Whoa. quickly zoom off Whoa. to the left, left of your screen. And then they just disappear. Now, Little says it appeared to be much larger than Holy a drone. Holy crap. Those lights... And it looked off. like something I'd never seen before at all. Like, um, I had seen drones fly before. Me too. And this was not like it's any not type of drone. The way it moved and how fast it could like take off, I'd never seen anything like it. I, a bunch of people stayed around recording because people were like terrified. I want to talk to this kid. We've Bryce been trying Garrick. to get you some answers. So we reached out to local law enforcement and Butler County Dispatch said they didn't know what it was. Brian right, Simpson, he's again. the president of the Astronomical Society in lights Cincinnati. In he also has weighed in. He said how quickly the lights sped off was what way too fast to be a drone that? in his opinion. And Simpson said the real question is, are these videos real? He says the real test of authenticity is if you get many reports of this same event. Well, I agree with that. If it turns out that there's a lot of people that recorded it from a lot of different places, that's incredible. If it's just these kids... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go with, well done, it's a cool TikTok video or whatever, but um, no, I, I need I need more people. I need people in cars and other locations around the area. But just from what I saw, very cool, not overly played to be like, obviously these fake videos that are all over TikTok of people like seeing UFOs and ghosts that are just bad acting, just bad acting, like play it down a little bit. This one is a little bit played 
more like that. So if it's real, it's cool. I'll throw that up on the uh, the uh, Facebook fan page as well. And last but not least, another video I've been wanting to watch. In Brazil, there was a light being that was spotted. In, uh, I can't get, I'm, I'm not going to get it right. Kahakum, Kaxum, Kaxumabu, Kaxumbu, Kahambu. I don't know. It's in Brazil. I don't know. It's a place in Brazil. More important part than the name of the town is the light boy, the light being. All right, I'm going to watch this one too. Okay. Aqui, gente, ó. Acabou de baixar aqui no Corvo Blake, aqui, ó. Yeah, man. Olha aqui. Acabou de baixar. All right, it's a video Baixou looking across a, late, a river of some kind into the, into aqui, the gente, jungle. And there is... Acabou de baixar aqui no Corvo Blake, aqui, ó. Olha aqui. All right, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. There is a light being, but it's not moving. It's not doing anything. Hold on. Wait, let me play that again. To me, I mean, yeah, it's a light, it's a... Outline of a person that's all lit up and reflective, but it's not moving. It's not walking around. It's not doing anything. It's just like, it's like if you cut out a, a human shape in a mirror and then you set it up on a hill and then you waited for the sun to hit it while the sun's setting, that's exactly what it would look like. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not imp- I'm not that impressed with that one, but still neat, something to do. All righty, uh, let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Remember that commercial back when the, you know, watched like Saturday morning cartoons? After these messages, we'll be right back. Remember that? All right, let's do that. We are back. All righty, one of the winners of the uh, phrase that pays T-shirt has gotten their shirt or their shirts on the shipping because they have the T public's been nice enough to include me saying, "Look, it's been shipped out." But the other winner, I haven't checked the email this morning, but as of the other day, the other winner still has not emailed me. Come forward to tell me what style and uh, size and color and all that fun stuff. So. If you got an email from me, you guys should check your email. If you got an email from me saying you won, no, seriously, you won, pick a shirt out. Pick the shirt out because I'll wait like another week or so, and then I'm going to choose another winner. That's right. There might be a different winner if this winner doesn't come forward. But I am very happy to say that one winner did come forward, was very excited about it, and their shirt is on the way to them. Um, all righty. <clears throat> so... Last week, uh, yeah, it was just a funky day job week. Uh, look, you guys want more more Paranormal Almanac episodes? Become a patron. If uh, if I start making enough money as a pat- in, on Patreon or ads or, you know, if someone pays me just a crap ton of money, I'll make way more episodes. But sadly, you know, I've got to have a day job. It's a great day job. Love it. But, you know, if someone pays me a hell of a lot of money, I'd much rather do paranormal almanac but uh so yeah i missed last week uh basically what i'm saying is i'm sorry i missed last week it's true um in fact i almost missed two weeks but i didn't here we are here we go let's do this wisconsin yeah sure it's great because it has cheese curds if you haven't had cheese curds oh are you missing out but supposedly it's also haunted as fuck so let's just talk about the haunted crap on this episode But just know that while I talk about this haunted crap, I'm thinking of cheese curds. Oh, man, I love cheese curds. You ever had fried cheese curds? That's some good, good stuff. That's good. All right. Anyhow. All righty. So I will start. uh, I'm going to say I started this episode as haunted Whitewater, Wisconsin, because there's tons of stories about a place in Wisconsin called Whitewater and how it's haunted as hell. But... The more I looked into it, some really deep looking into it, others spending five minutes looking into it going, oh, well, that's fake. Um, it, it went from haunted Whitewater, Wisconsin to haunted Whitewater, Wisconsin. Really? All right. Like I say, the first and pretty much only place I think, no, no, there's one spot I, 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 try to go outside, just outside the borders of of Whitewater because I needed something. Uh, pretty much the only place in Wisconsin that I'm going to talk about, though, on this episode is a little place called Whitewater. It's also known as the Second Salem, which I don't know how much I'd be promoting 
that given like, you know, what happened to the people in the first Salem spoiler in case you don't know which flambe just for a little bit there in Salem, not so much anymore. I don't think they don't talk about it too much anymore, but back in the day, which flambe Alrighty, So whitewater, where to begin? I don't know. I didn't, I've never been there. So I started looking into it and I randomly want to start in 1889 for a reason, though, that's when uh, Morris Pratt built the Pratt Institute, which was there to discuss spiritual studies. Now, you got to remember, this is the late 1800s. It was a hotbed for spiritualism around the world, and definitely this was no exception. So Pratt, who I assume started as the funny, chubby guy on a sitcom, and then one day, bam, became like a heartthrob who was all ripped and buff, Well, he opened it in 1889, and uh, he operated the Institute until 1902 when, um, well, he died. So, yeah, that kind of ended that. But you got to figure, if this guy was so into spiritualism and seances and talking to the dead, that that would be like the selling point for it. Like, in 1902, he died, but then he just came back every week and taught more classes as a ghost. No, no, that didn't happen. Sadly, not even remotely did that happen. Alrighty, one of his basic beliefs, though, was that there was a connection between this world and the spirit world, and that what we do on Earth influences the spirits, as well as what the spirits do in the spirit world influences living people. All right, yeah, I can get behind that. That's cool. But in order to see that connection, people must let go of all of their individual selves so they can see or communicate through that wall that separates the earthly world from the spirit world. All righty, that sounds a little culty to me. When anyone says, you know, you got to get rid of your individual self, or you got to give me all of your individual earthly stuff, because that's keeping you here, that's culty. There's there's your red flag right there. Um, Let's see, he was, uh, he was really secretive about what he was building to the people of Wisconsin, which caused a lot of people of Wisconsin to go, um, no, what are you building over there, dude? And then they went, ah, oh, you spiritualistic son of a bitch, you're a Satanist. Because, sure, why not? So the newspaper, The Register, as it was called, in April of 1889, they announced the opening and dedication of M. Pratt's Sanatorium and Hall of Psychic Science. On April 26th, 27th, and 28th, they were going to do like a big open house, dedication, all that fun stuff. But looking into it just a little bit more, it really wasn't the newspaper that was doing this article. Pratt paid basically for an advertisement to try and get people to come and check out his M. Pratt Sanitarium of and Hall of Psychic Science. It's a good name, though. So during the dedication... The Institute, like, basically slams Christianity, which even now if you do that, just a little bit, people get butt hurt. But back then, oh, they really wanted to Salem his ass. So Pratt gave a challenge to the local clergy to say, like, all right, all right, calm down, people. Like, I'm just saying that spiritualism has a chance to be even more loving and more better than Christianity if you guys give it a chance but why don't you come down and debate the topic? Pause here while Kurt sneezes. And you could have sneezed at home, too. You could have played along. You could have been like, well, if Kurt's going to pause for a second, this is the perfect opportunity for me to sneeze. That's why I give you that heads up. You know, in the future episodes, if I ever say, like, pause while Kurt sneezes, feel free to sneeze along. It's it's a fun game. All righty, where was I? Oh, yeah. So he wants to give the challenge to the local clergy to debate. And he says, here's the topic. The so-called teachings of Jesus Christ, as found in the New Testament, are immoral in their tendencies. Shocker, that didn't go over well either. Because people are like, what do you mean the so-called teaching? What do you mean, like, immoral? You son of a... Because of this, and basically no one attending his institute at first, the, uh, the locals started to call it Pratt's Folly, or the Spook's Temple. So, um, yeah, he's having a hard time of things because he keeps pissing off Christians in a very Christian community. Uh, fast forward. Let's, let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Pratt dies. 
the people running it decide, you know what, we should try and make it like 50-50 normal school and all the weird shit that he wanted. So the full course study at the Institute were twofold. One, general education, like grammar, literature, history, geography, astronomy, psychology, math, and music. That basically would pay for the second fold, which was the spiritualism curriculum, which included psychic research, study of the spirit world, comparative religion, evolution, and Bible study as it relates to the principles of spiritualism. So they're kind of hedging their bets a little bit. They're making it more of like a regular school with a little bit of Hogwarts thrown in at the end. So during the early 1900s, I looked into it, tuition was $50 per year plus a room at $1.50 or $2 per week depending on what size room you wanted. That seems kind of cool. Then, the 1930s come. It's called the Great Depression, and it basically shutters the school. But many people think that the years that the school was open, that this mysterious room that if you look on some sites say, look, it's pretty much guaranteed there was a seance room at the school. Let me just tell you that. But depending on where you get your information, some people say, It was an all-white room with all-white furniture. You were only allowed to go in if you were a medium wearing all-white. I can't find anything that says that's even remotely true. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of urban legends that go on about Whitewater, Wisconsin. So, yeah, there was a seance room. But some people are saying that because of the seances and all the occult stuff that happened there, that uh, that's what causes the haunted shit in the area that still goes on to this day, supposedly. Here comes the problem. People love to play up the Second Salem and the seances and that occult stuff and all the crap that happened there with very little facts to back any of it up. But I could kind of see that, yeah, if there is, if there are ghosts in Whitewater, and it seems like there are some of the basic stuff, and you're going to hear about that in a little bit, it could I'll put it that way. It could be connected back to the Pratt Institute and maybe they opened up a door and someone didn't know to close the door because they didn't seem like they were all that in depth in the knowledge of what to do if you did summon a ghost or a creature or a demon or whatever. All right. So now that we know maybe why it's haunted, let's try and get to the spooky. The fact that I say try right there will let you know how my research went. All right, first up, we have the University of Whitewater itself. More specifically, the Whitewater Green Hill Center of the Arts. In case you're new to the show, if it's got like a green fill, like when it says like Center of the Arts and it shows a big theater in there, just know that just about every theater is haunted and this one seems to be no exception. So we're starting off kind of good. A lot of people that go to school here Staff and students alike think that multiple ghosts inhabit the Whitehall Green Hill Center of the Arts and the theater. They say if you're there late at night, you can hear hammering coming from the metals room. Also, chairs move around in various classrooms. Still not enough. Okay, how about this? A ghost roams the backstage of the young auditorium. Still not enough for you? Okay, how about this? In the basement... You know, basements are spooky anyway. Well, anyhow, in their basement, they have all the usuals. That's right. We go, we've go. we already gotten to the paranormal usuals. I'm talking shadows, voices, things move. And they say the elevators descend from upstairs and open as you're passing by. Oh, okay. That, that last one doesn't seem so scary because I seriously don't think that ghosts need to use elevators. But sure. All of the usuals right there. So... This one, starting off, yeah, it does seem to have some paranormal activity. But we're just getting started, though. Let's go on over to the old water tower in Starin or Starin Park, which not surprisingly is called the Witch's Tower. There is a lot of witch talk when it comes to Whitewater, Wisconsin, with very little to back it up. In fact, how about none little? If you really look into it, I can't find anything about proof of a witch. Like, not even like Salem-level proof of a witch. But they call it the Witch's Tower. 
Here is the grain, and I'm talking a lot of grains of salt, stuff surrounding the water tower. Well, there are inward-facing spikes on the fence, which is meant to keep witches in. And the witches are said to meet up around the water tower to do their rituals, which, you know, Kurt here, seems like those spikes aren't really working. And if you actually look up photos of this water tower and the spikes, no, it's just, it's like a wrought iron fence that's around a water tower because they probably don't want people, you know, going up in the water tower and spray painting a dick on it or something. So... This seems normal so far. Uh, A lot of the water tower stuff seems like local urban legend. So I'm not going to go through a lot of that. Like, you know, the seances that they catch witches doing. Really? Find me one name of one person who's actually seen witches around the water tower doing seances or or summoning. And what are they summoning? It's no. It's all urban legend crap. But because of that, let's go over to the Calvary Cemetery. Why? Well, because an entire family is buried there. All right, Kurt, nothing strange there. Come on, Wisconsin, you got to do better. The family that's buried there that everybody says, their whole plot is haunted because of this. The family that's buried there is the Horan family, H-O-R-A-N. The family consisted of Bridget Ellen, or as she was known as Nellie. So we got Nellie, her sisters Anna and Agnes, and their parents, Joseph and Judith. They're all there in the cemetery, well, because supposedly Nellie killed them all. Yep. So, the Horan family arrived in Whitewater in 1880 with $5,000, which is way more money than I have now, but back then it was the equivalent of about $127,000. So, yeah, they were ballers. Skip to the good stuff. Judith, the mom, dies first in 1882 of poisoning, but there's no reason to suspect foul play, so no investigation was conducted. Joseph, the dad, died six weeks later. He fell suddenly ill and expired during terrible spasms and convulsions. So, poisoning, but again, no investigation. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, daughter Agnes dies at the age of 17. Her share of the inheritance passed on to the remaining sisters. Again, no investigation. So the family's, you know, getting smaller real quick. Skip ahead a couple of years, November 30th, 1884. Anna suddenly fell ill. After a few days, Anna asked her business partner, Miss Wakeman, to send for her for, for her sister, Nellie. So Nellie shows up, and, and uh, Nellie's like, Hey, Anna, how you doing? You're not doing so well. And, Anna, and uh, Nellie gives Anna, supposedly, a dose of opium powder. But after much suffering, Anna dead just a few hours later, this time, the, uh, the, the coroner's like, what the hell's happened to this family? And he checks, does an investigation, and he finds strychnine in her stomach. So, investigation time. The Milwaukee Daily Journal wrote on December 6th, It is believed that some person has been pursuing the family for years and that Miss Anna is the fourth victim. Who that person is, nobody pretends to say with enough facts to warrant an opinion. Officers are understood to be at work on the case. And should the chemist establish the girl was poisoned, some startling developments may be expected. The public is greatly mystified. So, this young girl supposedly comes forward to the authorities saying, Hey, you know what? I saw Nellie buying strychnine at the drugstore a few days prior to Anna's death. So, they checked the contents of Anna's stomach, sent to some guy in Milwaukee for chemical analysis. He confirms, yeah, it's definitely strychnine. You're right. There's poisoning. Boom, Nellie's charged. All righty, so Nellie's charged with her sister's death. And at the trial, the jury had a difficult time believing she could have committed murder. They deliberated for 12 minutes before acquitting her. The New York Times reported this. There was a great sensation in court. The accused girl shook hands with the judge, the jury, and the counsel and left for Whitewater with their sister and the young man to whom she was said to have married. What sister? I don't know. They're all dead. Let's keep going. Um... So this is where the internet sucks a little bit. There are a lot of sites that say, Nellie goes home. As soon as she gets home, she ingests strychnine and she dies. Nope. No, no, she doesn't. She goes on to live into her 70s, married, kids, all that fun stuff. So, people think her family walks the cemetery pissed off that Nellie is interred next to them. Because when she died in her 70s, Yeah, she was buried in the family plot. 
great urban legend, but there's no like, I saw Nelly or I saw Anna or the family's like, my sister killed us all with strychnine. None of that. So still not spooky enough for me yet. All right, that's the first cemetery that I'm going to talk about on here because uh, people say that if you draw a line from that cemetery to this next one, you start the Devil's Triangle, or as I'm going to call it, the Devil's Merkin. So the next cemetery is the Oak Grove Cemetery. This is where Mary Worth is buried. Who? I don't know. She is known as one of the witches of Whitewater. Why? I don't know. And get this. They consider Nellie one of the witches of Whitewater. Why? I don't know. Mary Worth is an axe murderer. I can't find anything to say that she's a witch. Absolutely nothing I can find that says she cursed the town before she died. But that's the rumor that she cursed the town before she died. So sure, why not? But uh, so this this woman named Mary Worth, uh, she's an axe murderer. So she kills some people with axes. Sure. She's buried at the cemetery where her her spirit is seen often. Sure. Why not? Locals say that she can be seen on Halloween Eve amongst the gravestones. She can also be seen on the Tincher Real, uh, Realty Office because it was formerly the house of Lucius Winchester, who was cursed by which Mary Worth. And then she kills him. All right, no no evidence of any of that. Uh, look, the regular haunted stuff happens here at the cemetery. Shadows, voices, that kind of stuff. So that's cool. I like that. But we don't need all this fake backstory. Let's move on to the third cemetery that makes up the Devil's Merkin. And that's the Hillside Cemetery. This cemetery has the ghost of a witch. Her name, Mary Worth. Wait, What? They say her mausoleum resides at the highest point on the cemetery. Hold on a second. Wait, what? Yeah, that's right. Both the Oak Grove Cemetery and the Hillside Cemetery, depending on what sites you go to, say that Mary is buried there and she's a witch of Whitewater and all that bullshit. It seems to me that she's not buried at the Hillside Cemetery. She is buried at the Oak Grove Cemetery. But again... Depending on where you go, and there's a hell of a lot of sites about this, the urban legends seem to have just been like, oh, yeah, no, she's there now, too. It's cool. She haunts them both. Uh, So basically, at this point in my research, I got really angry at Whitewater, who needs to straighten its shit out online. People figure out where your shit's buried. You know, you want to have a witch? Why is she a witch? What did she possibly do to make herself a witch? Because nothing is online about this. Anyhow, so people say that the triangle is one part of the devil's pentagram and a gate to hell. All right, sure, fine, whatever. Let's, it's a great ghost story, um, I guess, but it's just the basics and urban legends and all that. So let's keep on keeping on. Let's keep finding something in Whitewater, Wisconsin that makes me go, holy shit, this place is haunted or cursed or whatever. I want something good. So let's go to the Anderson Library. The Anderson Library has a haunted or cursed book that if you read it, you will die. All right, now we're talking. I got all excited about this one. There's like, oh, I'll tell you the story. So local legend says that this book has such a dark and scary content in it that if you read it, you die. And that three students and one professor were driven to suicide after reading this book. All right, now we're getting into it. Now we're getting good. So what's in the book? Is it like Fifty Shades of Grey? Is it a Seinfeld autobiography, a Guy Fieri cookbook? Like, what is it? Well, a lot of sites say you don't know because the book is kept under lock and key and brought out under Plexi every Halloween to put on display to keep people from reading it, though. And, well, you know, if you spend five minutes online, it's an old hymnal, a large antique hymnal written in Latin that was donated to the library after an area church closed its doors. And get this, 
you can go to the Anderson Library and request to see and read the book all you want, and many, many people have done so and not died. <sighs> Come on, damn you, Wisconsin. You better get spookier real quick for me. Let's go to, and you know what I will say? I'll go there. I'll read this hymnal. If someone wants to fly me out to Whitewater, Wisconsin, like some news story or local TV station or whatever wants to fly me out there, I'll read the book as best I can. It's written in Latin. I really can't read Latin. Maybe that's why people aren't dying because no one can read Latin. They're just like kind of flipping through the book and they're like, yeah, I feel fine. But you know, I'll bring like Google translator. I'll translate that whole goddamn hymnal. I'll read the whole damn thing. And then, uh, I, I probably won't die from that. Maybe boredom, but not from the book. All right, let's go over to the Hamilton house bed and breakfast. This one, in case you want to go to it, is located at 328 West Main Street in Whitewater. It was built in the 1880s. Then, in the 1950s, falls into disrepair. The walls, flooring, need redoing, you know, like, a bunch of shit needs to be taken care of. So people start working on the house. When they start working on the house, they see the, the ghost of a little boy named Posey who used to live there. And they also see the ghost of a woman in her nightgown out in the East Gardens. Now we're getting cool. So uh, the house becomes a fraternity in the 1960s and 70s, and students say they see the little boy at the foot of their beds in the middle of the night all the time. Lots of students are seeing this. No longer urban legend. Now I'm digging this. They describe him as, quote, an annoying kid who acted like a little brother who needed attention. His favorite room was his mother's room, which was at the top of the stairs. So the little boy, Posey, uh, it disturbed one man so much that he said he will never step foot into the Hamilton house again in the 1970s. Cool. I dig it. So it, after a while, it stops being used as a frat house and becomes a doll museum. Yep. You guessed it. The dolls won't stay put. The staff often found the dolls moved by themselves in different parts of the house from where they had left them, including locked up in cases. Okay. Getting creepier. They also said they heard a woman's humming in the house often. That house seems cool. I'm liking this so far. So, local legend says there was the tile of that little boy Posey that was over the fireplace, like the little tile painted photo of him kind of a thing that was over the fireplace in the 1880s that uh, went missing. And because of that, that's what causes Posey's ghost to be so active, basically. So get this. They suddenly found the missing tile of the sun's face out in the East Garden while renovating the house after it was a doll museum. So the spot they found it was where the ghost of that woman in the nightgown was often seen standing. All righty, now this is cool. Kurt here, I'm just guessing, but she was probably trying to tell everyone, hey, you know, something's right here. You should come over here and look down here. But anyhow... They find the tile, thankfully. They return it to the fireplace facing because they're trying to, you know, refurb the house. And they said they never saw either ghost again. Damn it. That one was just getting good, but I guess no more ghosts there. So someone go and steal that tile again, and let's see if we can spark it all up again. All righty. Let's move over to the Whitewater Lake. This one had promise again. Started really good. The, the Whitewater Lake in Wisconsin is said to have a monster that lives or lived there. Cool. Kurt here, not a monster. And when I say that, I don't mean like Nessie's not a monster. I mean, it's not, there's no monster. All right, but we have to go back to 1923. When a huge grain of salt story comes out with no confirmation, no names, or anything that says, Fishermen claimed a large creature with tentacles overturned their boat and dragged them under. They fought against it and eventually broke free, but found themselves covered in small bite marks. Problem here is, it's not in any newspaper, nor could I find it in any police reports, nor could I find any names, any dates, any anything. When I looked into it, what I could find this weird, like, Whitewater Lake story. Um, it's not from 1923, though. It's from 1992, and it goes a little something like this. Whitewater police received multiple reports, mostly from students. Kurt here, all from students. 
that robed figures were, were performing some sort of ritual on the shores of the Whitewater Lake. They said the group was chanting and swaying when all of a sudden a fog rolls in off the lake with an eerie green glow. And then something started to come out of the water. Now again, can't find any specific names, but many sites say. One eyewitness said, We heard the water splashing in this deep gurgling noise. We all just looked at each other, but when we heard this slurping sound and saw something coming out of the water, we ran like hell. In the morning, police did investigate the beach. They said they found the remnants of the ritual, including rocks and small bones arranged into mysterious symbols in the sand. Okay. One thing that I found about Whitewater is they love to play up these local urban legends. They love to do the spoopy, spooky, kind of funky stuff. And every time that I found anyway, it revolves around students performing pranks. Again, you if you really break down this story, yeah, there's a police report, sure. They did receive multiple reports, but all from students. It seems like this was another prank on that. So, I don't know. But... This next story also only has one source, so I'm going to read it directly from that source. This is from Lon Strickler of Phantoms and Monsters. He says he received a report via telephone on February 9th, 2018, from a witness who said she'd seen a man-like being with pterodactyl-like wings gliding across the highway outside of Whitewater, Wisconsin back in 2016. She says... In late September 2016, at approximately 10 p.m. Central Time, the eyewitness was driving east on East State Road 59 South Janesfield Street, approximately seven miles west of Whitewater, Wisconsin. She was heading home after visiting her daughter. Suddenly, a man-like being with huge pterodactyl wings glided in front of her and behind another car, flying from right to left at an altitude of 10 feet or so above the road. The witness, the witness was totally shocked at what she was seeing. The being's body was definitely human in shape, about six foot in length, and the wingspan was at least twice the body's length. The wings were membraned like that of a bat and never moved or flapped. The entire being was dark in color. There seemed to be a structure along the top of its head, but no eyes or facial features were seen. The witness's reaction was to hit the gas pedal and get out of the area. Kurt here, that's a good idea. The driver in front of her must have noticed the winged being as it emerged from the right and sped away as well. Kurt here, good idea too. The witness was inspired to report her sightings after seeing a similar sighting from Wisconsin posted to Strickler's website. She had read my recent post in reference to the sighting in Chippewa Falls and was advised by her husband to call and inform me about what she had encountered. This report is one of several similar stories and sightings from southern Wisconsin, which according to Strickler, Strickler are currently being investigated. There are other sighting reports from southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois that, and the task that the task force is currently investigating. The location of the sighting puts it within 10 miles of West Kettle Moraine State Forest and Whitewater Lake, and a similar distance southwest of Cravath and Trip Lakes, less than 100 miles from Chicago and around 50 miles from Lake Michigan. Due to its proximity to Chicago, the sighting has been added to Strickler's ongoing map of sightings and will be included in the singular Fortean Society's running timeline. No idea what that means, but sure, sounds great. Uh, He finishes by saying this is the latest in a string of flying creature sightings reported in the Chicago area. Most of the sightings have taken place near the lakefront within a few miles of Lake Michigan, although there are some reports coming from the suburban surrounding Chicago and even farther field. The sightings generally take place in the evening or late at night, um, often in or near a park or around water, and witness communities, uh, witnesses consistently, sorry, describe a large bat or bird-like creature with a humanoid features. There we go. I dig it. That's a cool story. I can't confirm any of it because it's just one source. Um, yeah, sounds very Mothman-like. I'll give them, I'll give it like, all right, that's cool. So we got a couple of like the usual ghost stuff. That's cool. We got that one. That's cool. Um, let's keep trying, shall we? I know it's almost an hour. I don't care. Let's keep trying. Uh, let's see. Residents of Whitewater Lake will tell the story of a bunch of weird things that happened during the summer of 1944. Kurt here. What strange things? No one says because there's no names. There's no nothing on this one either. I already hate this story, but they said to make whatever it was stop. The men from the area gathered at a small local cemetery 
where they are said to have dug up all the coffins that have been buried there vertically in the ground. Why? Who knows? All, look, we all know that having almost no details makes a story more believable, and this story is chock full of no details. So, summer of 1944, strange things are happening. Cool. I'd love to know more about that. No, you don't want to tell me that? Cool. So, uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, how about all the men gather up and dig up all the coffins that were buried vertically in the ground there? What? Wait, what? Why were the coffins? Shh, don't worry about it. Just shh, just keep, let's keep going. Yeah, that's what this story is. All right, so the men brought the coffins back to Whitewater Lake, weigh them down with rocks, and throw them in there. What? What is happening with this story? All right, here's my favorite line from this story. That put an end to whatever strange occurrences had been plaguing those who lived on the lake. No. You're a shitty story with no details, and I'm left with way more questions than answers. Why were a bunch of, a bunch of uh, graves uh, dug vertically? Why would you think, oh, there's a bunch of weird shit happening around the lake? It's got to be because of those vertical graves, man. I told you guys we shouldn't have vertically grave those people. Let's dig them up. Oh, and then put them back normally in the, in the cemetery to quiet their spirits? No, 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 fuck that. Let's dig them up. Let's throw a bunch of rocks in their coffins and then just chuck them in the lake. Because that will calm everything. What? Come on, guys. None of that story makes any sense. Here's another coffin story that's light on details. In 1970, the coffin of a little girl, or possibly little boy, because, you know, facts are hard. <sighs> the coffin of a little girl, or boy, was taken from one of the local cemeteries, and the coffin was mysteriously relocated to the nearby college campus. Okay, I was going to get angry at this one, then I looked into it a little bit more. I couldn't tell you if it's a little boy or a little girl, but it does seem that this story has a kernel of truth, that in the 70s, not 1970, but in the 70s, there was a fraternity prank where they dug up a child's coffin and put it on the campus. Um, good one, I guess. Good, Good job, guys. That's... That's funny. All right, let's keep going. Next up is Wells Hall, where in 1981, the girls of Alpha Sigma Sorority heard loud noises coming from the basement while they ate dinner. So they go down to the basement. I can only assume wearing only t-shirts and panties because this is the classic 80s horror movie beginning. Plus, you know, I'm telling the story, so now it's canon. So a bunch of girls, sorority girls, in their underwear go down into the basement, and they see bricks of the basement floor were found scattered everywhere. And when they went to check it out, they looked down in the hole because that's what you do. That This is definitely like the beginning of like an 80s slasher film. And something grabs the girl's head and like just pulls her under, and her legs are like kicking in the air, that kind of a thing. No. So they uh, look down in the hole, and they see that it's a tunnel entrance. So in 1981... A new urban legend sprung up about how the tunnel systems were used by the witches back in the day as a way of traveling between the town's oldest mansion-sized homes to different parts of the town in Whitewater so that they could do their rituals and sacrifices without being spotted by civilians. That's cool. I can say the tunnels are real. They probably were discovered in 1980, or they were found by the girls of that sorority in 1981. But five minutes online, people, five minutes online, and I found this. In the late 1890s, the university constructed the first underground tunnels with pipes carrying steam from central heating stations to campus buildings. With the addition of chilled water pipes to provide air conditioning, the tunnel system remains a far more efficient and economical way to heat and cool a sprawling campus compared to installing individual HVAC systems in every building in Wisconsin. Yeah, so the fact that there was bricks scattered all around was probably due to pressure and how old those tunnels were. So it, it just popped, you know, like air tunnel, boom, 
popped some bricks. They saw the tunnel. None of the other crap is true. It's cool. I like I'd like to walk through some 1890s tunnels. That'd be kind of neat, but come on, Whitewater. Scare me. I want to believe in all your bizarre stories. But the more I look into it, the more I go, well, I can debunk that pretty quick. Well, I can debunk that pretty quick. So let's try uh let's try this one. This one happened just outside Whitewater in Troy. It's the Cobblestone Inn. It's the former hotel. It began construction in 1846, opened in 1849 by Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Brady. Some sites say that Abraham Lincoln stayed there. That's cool, but get this, though. After a successful few years of business and paying off their mortgage, the Bradys left to travel on an ocean voyage to visit family in England and were never heard from again. The inn's bar and restaurant are now said to be haunted by the Bradys because they disappeared. People hear the usuals, footsteps, voices, see shadows, object move, all that stuff. But you might go on, oh, that's cool. I want to go to this. I'll go to the Cobblestone Inn. That sounds like fun. I'll get a drink there. Yeah, I would like to as well. But in May of 2022, the upkeep of the building became too great, and the three-story Cobblestone building was demolished. Womp, womp. All righty. Last try for Whitewater. I mean, that was cool. That is a good thing. I don't think that them, like, leaving Wisconsin to go on a ocean voyage, they probably moved back to England. I guarantee you, if I searched even more, I could find more information about Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Brady. I guarantee they were heard from again. Or maybe they died on the voyage. Shit happened like that in the 1850s. Like, come on. Okay. Last one, last try for Whitewater. Let's talk about the school dorms. I talked about them for a little bit with the sorority, but let's go into it a little bit more. The Delta Zeta House says that they have bathroom stalls doors that slam when nobody is there. And that uh, Clem Hall has uh, apparitions, all the basic, all the usual stuff, uh, stuff moving, voices, laughter, the, you know, they can hear people running up and down the hallways. Uh, Fricker Hall. They say that there's an apparition of a deceased student. He's been seen in the basement. And a ghost librarian has been known to open up doors and elevators for the living at Nillens Hall. So, it seems like if you really want to see a ghost in Whitewater, you should go to the dorms. Because that seems to be where everything is happening still. So, there, yeah. There's a little bit of ghost activity in Whitewater, but a lot of the stories really seem to be urban legends that the students especially, but the people in the town really like to keep, you know, keep it going because it's fun, you know, and why not? Yeah, urban legends are fun. They're great. But put names to them, put dates to them, put facts to them. If you want to start an urban legend, the best way to do it is to have some names, some details, some stuff that makes it seem a little bit more real because a lot of the stories from Whitewater were easily debunkable BS. And that bums me out. It really does. I really want it. I, like I said, I went into this one going, whoa, Whitewater, Wisconsin, a whole town, the second Salem that has a shit ton of cool witches and monsters and ghosts. It's got everything, you know, seances. It's got everything. And then... Very little of it turned out to be true. So, you know what? Let's have some whitewater fun real quick before I go. So I pulled up a map of whitewater. And then I looked for three of the same businesses. So I can make a triangle. See where I'm going with this? In this case, it was a convenience store called a quick trip. K-W-I-K, a quick trip. It's kind of like a 7-Eleven. Now I noticed there are two quick trips in whitewater. So I drew a line between those two, and it covers both lakes in Whitewater. Interesting. Then I found the next closest quick trip, which is to like the northwest. And if you complete the triangle, in that one triangle covers all the haunted locations I've talked about so far. So obviously, the witches use the quick trips to get supplies for their summoning spells. See? 
I can do some, I can do dumb stuff about whitewater too. It doesn't take much. You put any three, look, you find three things in any town and you draw lines between those three things, you're going to draw a triangle. It's not hard to do. In fact, it's really easy to do. So, you know, find your local weird shit. Find three local weird shit that happens in your local area and then just draw the lines and go, look, there's whatever your town is called, Triangle or Merkin, spiritual Merkin, as I like to say. Um, Yeah, I had a hard time with this one. I really, really wanted to go into this having an entire town that was haunted, like I said, and uh, it didn't happen. Sadly, it didn't happen, but... There was some spiritual stuff. There was some ghost stuff there, but just not a ton of it. So once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. Next week, all UFO edition. Looking forward to it. Necromsylvania.